on the ground, but I'm not looking down. Feel the warmth of the breeze rushing over me. Now it's all in hand. Reach and touch the sky. We can't be Hey everyone! Hey, hey, hey! Welcome to Hanging with Hillary. I'm being chased by a mad flying saucer because we are hanging here with Hillary. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. So give a roaring welcome to my co-host, David Maldo. David! You know, that never gets old. Never, never, it. never. I love it. You You've timed it out too so much fun. Well. <laughs> so welcome everyone. If this is your first time tuning in, uh, yeah, I always have to remember where you're at. You're over there. Uh, I'm Hillary Scarl. I'm so happy you're here you're on a Wednesday, the best day of the week. David, how was your week? My week is good. Hey, Jim, sunny South Florida. I'm here hey, in sunny hey. South Florida too. Right on. Stay safe. Hey. Oh, we got some sunshine states. We got all sunshine states going here tonight. We've nice. got uh, Florida's the official sunshine sun, say sunshine state. Michael Murray's gonna be so disappointed. I didn't do my vocal warm ups before the show. Got marbles in my mouth. But uh, we're here every single Wednesday. We're talking to artists, actors, filmmakers, composers, designers about the journey of being a creative professional because it's never quite what you think. So I get to bring my friends, my colleagues and hang out here, talk about their careers, their lives, their journeys, offer tips and answer questions. So I'm super happy you're here. So please hit the subscribe button and to notify when we go live because we have some amazing guests who are coming up. Next week, we've got uh, Dalen Musson, who is a writer on Marvel. And then on 421, we've got Jamie Neal, who's one of the few international movement choreographers for brands and products. What he does is really outstanding. So, but tonight, we've got somebody super special all the way from Hawaii. Let's give a warm aloha to Mark Beltsman. Welcome, welcome, Yay. Mark. All the way from Maui. How are you doing? Oh, you forgot to unmute yourself. No, I didn't. I'm just talking with you. <laughs> oh, damn it. Damn it. We were like, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotcha. he's, a, he's a comic. He's a comic, this one. How is Maui? My goodness. Stop. <laughs> Um, Zoom. It's not even funny like, in 2021 because it's not, not it real. is you can't everybody's dealing with it. Everybody's on Zoom and everybody turn your you're on mute. You're at turn your camera on. Yep. You got grandma, you got uh life in Maui is fabulous. It uh, living aloha is uh uh quite extraordinary. I'm so grateful to be here and uh one of the best moves I ever made. Well, you and Bev, uh, your fabulous, funny wife, uh, just moved out there. What, two years ago now? How long? Uh, it's been about a year and seven months, like right before the pandemic. We moved here in October of 2019, not knowing anything about the world was going to shut down. And boy, <laughs> it was just uh, one of the most special things we ever did. Uh, this is one of the most as you all know, one of the magical places on earth, but it's been one of the safest places during the pandemic. Uh, I think Hawaii in its entirety has had less than 500 deaths and 20,000 cases in a year, over a year. 
and uh, that's mostly on Oahu. So Maui is pretty, pretty, you know, untouched so far, but they've opened up the airports and now we have 20,000 tourists a day pouring in here and things are spiking. So, so we, but life is good. Life is good. It's, I'm glad you guys are oh. safe. <laughs> I met Mark and Bev in LA uh, just a couple of years before they moved and got a chance to know them. But I want to, for those of you few unfortunates who don't know Mark Beltzman, I'm going to give you a, a little intro to his bio. Uh, oh the two people that don't, don't know you, we can, we can, because everyone's like, oh yeah, I know that guy. When they saw your picture, uh, like, uh. Yeah, that guy. I knew that um, he was on that thing. So you're the guy on the thing. But officially, his bio reads that he is an actor, writer, director, and improviser across the U.S. and Europe. He's the co-founder of Maui Improv and is also one of the founding members of Improv Olympic in Chicago. He is an actor, director at the famed Second City in Chicago and directed the Second City Alumni Jam in Los Angeles. And he also directed and taught at the Second City Training Center, Improv Olympic West and the Upfront Comedy Showcase. As an actor, he has appeared in Billy Madison, The Wedding Singer, Speed 2, Star Maps, Seinfeld, Roseanne, Norm, Curb Your Enthusiasm, According to Jim, Cold Case, House, Pretty Little Liars, Life in Pieces, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. No, it's fabulous. Let's give a round of applause again for Mark Feltzman. Ah, all those credits. You've had an incredible career, but I want to be able to show the highlight uh, reel. So, um, and then we're no, going to talk a little bit about your work. My, is my career over? Is that my <laughs> it's career? done. That's it. This is this is this is your uh, denouement. Is your is hanging with Hillary? Your crowning achievement because once you're here, where yeah. else can you go? There's nowhere else honest. to go. We're, we've moved. We've already made it to the top. That's it. You made it here with Hillary and David. So. Uh, David, let's show the good people at home and uh, from wherever they're Zooming and YouTubing in, watching a little bit about Mark Beltzman in our screening room, and then we'll be back to talk to Mark. Look, she came. She came, too. People, we are in the presence of greatness. Yes. 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 You bastard. You hit the suit. I will blackball you from this town. No, I'm suing you. I don't know how, but I am going to get you. You are going to pay. Well, look at this, a baby. I love a baby. Bald and chubby, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to know it? Just a, just a small little thank you Aww. for your patience with our little angel. Thank you. That's very kind. Cookies. Did you make these? Yes, I did. Did you bake them with coconut? <laughs> because you love coconut? <laughs> I just don't think that men understand how different everything is for us. I can think of a million examples from this week alone. Have a great day. Oh, thanks. You too. Mm -hmm. You have a beautiful mouth. Have a great day. Hey, Mark. Hey, Larry. Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm so sorry okay. to hear about your stepfather. Yeah, thanks. I just got back from Detroit. Oh, no kidding. I'm, I'm so sorry because I wanted to go to the wake that night. I was pretty uh, pissed uh, about that. I thought we were friends. Ed Excuse came. Me. Ed came? Yeah. He was there. He brought flowers himself. He delivered them himself. I mean, it's just a courtesy. You could have at least called, Larry. One piece of gum? Please tell me these canisters are marked correctly. The preview for Kiss Me Deadly, the canisters got switched and the, the atomic bomb went off in the second act. I hear this one bombs in the first. Just eat your goddamn sandwich. Who's this? Just a friend helping out. Is that a problem? Only if she's making melon balls without a hairnet. I come here all the time. Don't embarrass me. You're just going to come and I'm going to take a shower and you sit and have a drink. I need to know someone before they touch my balls. All right. Hi, I'm Harvey. Hi. Ow! What are you? We just met. You got to know me. Have you ever sat on a plane next to somebody who wouldn't shut the hell up? Well, it was like that. And she wouldn't stop talking to her dog. Okay, so she started singing, and that's when you finally snapped? I didn't snap. I got fed up. If you want me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you need anything, don't call me. 
mean, that's my story. Wow. My God, what a career. Again, it's, it's, that blows me away. I'm just blown away because like, you know, I I mean, I'm not in the industry. I'm just, but I, I watch things and, and, you know, there's a lot of actors I see that just kind of play. Okay. He's that guy and he's in that role. That was like 10 different actors. That was like those characters. They, they are not from the same, you know what I mean? It's they're, they're not the same person They're They don't have the, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the terminology. Hillary, Hillary helped me out. Diversity. He's he he uh, gets cast in a role and then acts as somebody who is not himself. It's just amazing. Or draws upon. Mark, how would you describe that? If somebody says, uh, "Do you usually play one type?" Yes. Would you say yes? The funny sidekick guy, like how did I, how? Honestly, you know, to be perfectly honest, I yeah. I don't even think of it in terms of that. You know, the the writer gives you the story, and you immerse yourself in the story, and the story leads you on a journey, and you just follow that journey. And uh, it's always a little piece of yourself and everything that you play. You can't help it, uh, and you try and. Um, you know, I guess diversify a little bit and change things up and try and play a little bit, uh, whatever it is. Um, you know, and we, I'm, I'm an, imp- I'm, I'm trained in improvisation and, uh, improvisation is all about ensemble work and ensemble work is all about making your partner look good. You look twice as good. So as a character actor, I go into a job or a script or, a production and just think, how can I make this person look good? What do they need? And deliver that. And, you know, um, I saw this really magical uh, post on Facebook today. It kind of goes along with this, which is a teacher gave uh, all the kids in the school a balloon and have them write their name on it. And then they had to blow it up, put their name on it, and they put it in the hallway. And there's like hundreds of balloons. And he said, go find your own, the balloon with your name on it. Nobody could do it. And he said, okay, stop. Now just pick up the balloon next to you and fi- look at the name on it and go give it to the person who's naming. It. And within five minutes, everybody had their own balloon. And he said, now see, uh, if, if you're looking for your own happiness, you'll never find it. But if you're going, if you're looking for the happiness of others, then you'll always find happiness through serving other people. And I like being of service and in service. And that's what, you know, my life is all about. That's a great metaphor. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm curious, out of all those roles, uh, I know as an actor that you, you know, you love working, you love being on set and ensemble, but was there a particular project that when you read it, you're like, oh, I cannot wait to play this role. I'm so excited about this. Can you think of one project, maybe something we saw on the reel that you just were just chomping at the bit and said, this is, this is going to be so much fun to act. Not particularly as far as like getting a script, but, you know, working on certain projects, like, you know, and anybody asked me, who's your favorite actor? Or what's your favorite job you ever had? Hands down. It's working with John Candy. No question about it. I mean, I got to do uh, home alone and I was in uncle buck and I got cut out of that, but we had three glorious days and, oh. and John was just one of the greatest, most generous human beings that ever lived. Um, and I learned from him and, you know, I had him doing, you know, 3D house of beef in the camera within like two minutes of being on the set and he never wanted to be alone. So he would just look at you and while they were setting up the camera and the lighting and he, you'd look at him and you'd be in the middle of an improv scene just because you just made eye contact with each other and just screwing around. And he was so generous that way. And as a matter of fact, there was a great story in the home alone at the end well, there's the scene um, in the in the van where we're all in the back of the van, and uh, earlier in the day, John Candy only had 20 day, 20 hours, 20 hours to shoot that whole movie, the entire movie. That's all he had. 20 hours. Yeah, I mean, he had one day, 24 hours, and we were going on hour 20. 
Uh, but let me back up a little bit. So um, John Candy's talking to John Hughes and Christopher Columbus. I think it was his first movie he directed. And they go, Mark, come over here. We have this idea. We want to be in the back of the van. What do you think? And I, I came up with all this stuff, right? I came up with all mm -hmm. these great ideas and, and scenically and stuff. And then um, we were going on hour 20 and uh, John Hughes and, and, and Christopher Columbus said, okay, fuck this. Uh, it's gone too long. We're just going to do a two shot on Catherine O'Hara and John Candy. You all pretend like you're asleep in the back of the van. And then John Candy, they go action. And John Candy spews all that stuff that I said in that meeting hours earlier. And they yell cut. And John Candy looks at me and goes, hey, kid, I used all your stuff. I hope you don't mind. And I, was, uh, was great. and I was too naive it was like one of my first four or five movies and I was just I should have asked for writing credit but he was just the most generous man and as a matter of fact I'm directing a play we'll talk about that later but his daughter is in my play right now mm. yeah Jennifer Candy is she as funny wow. as her dad yeah she looks just like him spitting image amazing oh my mm. god what a, that's I, I can't believe they shot the movie in 20 hours. That's kind of insane. Oh, yeah. I mean, Amazing. it was insane. I mean, we were there. It was, yeah. Wow. Well, John Candy and John Hughes were very good friends, you know, after planes, trains. So John Candy was doing John Hughes a favor, and he just had one day. That's all he had in his schedule. So tell me about, like, your first break. You had, you had been trained. You were working. And what was the journey like up until your break? And what do you consider to no, be? I, I never trained or anything for my No first training. Break. No, I was, um, I played tuba. I still do. We'll talk about that later as well. And um, uh, my best friend from high school is named uh, Robert Teachman. And his parents would have these parties that we would all hang out with and had a blast. And there was a couple of photographers there. One of them was named Charlie Shritty. And uh, Charlie said, can we rent your tuba for a Lazy Boy Chair magazine? And I said, sure. And he said, you want to be in it? And I was. And that was my first acting job was I actually started out as a model. And then there was another man at that, um, and, 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 and that uh, gathering, friends of uh, the Teachman's. His name was Amin Harani. And he was another very famous photographer in Detroit. And uh, he gave me my break uh, on my first TV commercial, which also was all still shots. But it was, uh, I was Tony Baker, the high low driver who drove his forklift into 400 refrigerators. And they had a damaged goods sales at Highland Appliance. And that was a regional commercial, but it ended up being sold to like four other markets. So I was getting like tons of residual checks and making a pretty comfortable living at like 21. And I've never looked back. I've never had to do anything else uh, other than act, teach direct you know perform uh since i was 21. so i think there's a lesson in there as far as modeling being the gateway i mean naomi campbell l mark beltzman that you know that's yes. that's a doorway so uh i guess that's anything is possible yeah most people don't know i'm a really hot model yeah, i know you're a hot model i, see. Most people, I know you do that's why i'm on the show <laughs> and your and your wife obviously thinks that you're a hot model so sometimes she does sometimes she doesn't. depends well, on the but that's like well how long you've been married you and bev have been together uh, 40 39 going on 40 years yeah 38 39 years something like that and you guys still act like a bunch of newlyweds so it's good it's very good bev's doing great andre we're very happy here we have a great relationship and uh you know we both uh, my joke is you know uh first she raised me and then she married me that's my joke <laughs> like uh, which is true. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah which, is, which is which is basically true but um she's uh she's doing wonderful and she's healthy and uh, and we're both uh, very happy that we're here so life is well great. I love you guys so much, and I'm so glad you're here. You have a, a nice comment from Jim Kavalski, who says that he loved the Highland Appearance commercial. So, oh yeah, that's an old family friend who lives in Florida. Uh, there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. And he loves your commercial. So see, you get a fan from early on, a fan for life. Well, one of the things because we do have a lot of young actors who watch the show. And, you know, they see a reel like that and be like, my God, you know, you've, you've acted with some of the best in the world and done, you know, from Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm and, you know, Home Alone, my God. But 
they it seems like you just work 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 but you know we know as actors that isn't always the case that there's a journey and a path so uh i think we're going to go to our next scene david to show this is this is one of my scenes that i it's special to me because to me, you learn from the failures in life and the disappointments. So let's go to the graveyard or the set is called Scripts from the Morgue. So. I don't know if we have our music there. Oh, we do have our music. So I actually, this set up came from, I actually have a filing cabinet that I've nicknamed the Morgue because it's filled with projects that never quite made it, never had a life. And we were talking, you had some stories also that um, these crazy casting stories. So you had one from Denny and Bobby. Can you share with us what happened with Denny and Bobby? Oh, oh yeah. Um, well, first, let me, before we launch it, let me just say, um, you know, for all those people who are looking to do that, being an actor is a lot like just being an Olympic athlete. Like you train for days, weeks, months, and decades for that one moment when you get the audition and then book the job and you're ready to go when they say action. And so that's really what it's all about. It's just training day and night for decades. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, an Olympic athlete trains all that time for 0 0.001 fraction of a second between a medal or not. And that's basically what we do. People think- But what are you doing when you're training though? Are, are you doing vocal exercises? Are it doesn't you matter what you do, you can, it, just life experiences. It, it, you know, either having fun or training in classes, improv, acting, music, dance, painting, any kind of creative arts trains you to be a better human being and being the best human be you can be. Um, my, uh, one of the things that I teach is life happens outside of your comfort zone. That's where growth takes place. So all the work we do is designed to get you out of your comfort zone. And when you're out of your comfort zone, then your true innocence and vulnerability perks up. And most people push it down and don't want to deal with that. So as mm -hmm. actors, we're constantly forcing ourselves to work internally on ourselves, our emotions, our past, our traumas to get to a better place and evolve as an actor. And I say, figure out what's working and do more of it instead of trying to change and fix what's wrong. Changing and fixing things does not work. So you need to think, how do you know the difference between the two? One makes you smile and one doesn't. We're all born with an internal mechanism that tells us what's working and what's not. So mm -hmm. I don't care what it is, you figure out what's working and you do more of it. And eventually the percentages of whatever's not working will switch. So very little is not working and everything in your life is working and that's what this work is all about. Now for all the actors, the thousands that train every year at the elite acting schools, whether it's NYU or Juilliard or uh, going through Improv Olympic or the Groundlings and there's so many that really do work and they work for years and never make it as an actor. And your, what, what is your thoughts to who works and who doesn't? Because if it was just well, training, we'd have 10 million actors out there. It, it's a fallacy to even use those terms, making it as an actor. There's no such thing as making it. If you're making, if you get to the point where you're great, you're luck, lucky enough and talented enough to make a million dollars a picture, there's somebody making five. And if you're making five, there's somebody making eight. And if you're making eight, there's somebody making 10. And if you're making 10, there's somebody making 20. There's no such thing as making it. You're always at a level trying to get to the next ring, to trying to get to the next rung of the ladder. And so it makes no difference. We're all the same. We're all human. We're all looking to evolve and grow and get to a better place and to be more comfortable if, with our own authenticity, just being ourselves. And that's really, uh, for me, what this works about. Well, one thing I usually encourage young actors or actors who are looking to work is that work begets work and especially yeah. during the pandemic that it's hard to audition you don't control who calls you in if you get an agent if the agent calls you in or you know it sets up auditions and then if you get cast so there's so many variables on the outside that control whether you work which is why I'm such a big fan of self generated work and for those you don't know Mark was in my little short film uh, the singletons yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, oh, that we shot all during the pandemic. And we're going to show that in a couple of weeks with my DP, Jeff Gatesman. Uh, but the fact that nobody hired me and I like working with my friends. So I very rarely use casting directors. Usually they fill in the gaps and go after the bigger names, but like it's it's great when you work with people at different levels and you know what they can do so i believe in self-generating work and that keeps you fresh that keeps you sharp and good act to me like you're right mark that actors the goal is to work and to work as often as you can if that just means getting up doing improv or making short films yourself Mm -hmm. writing things for you exactly right but i want to hear the denny and bobby story oh it's um it's called denny and bobby um, oh. <laughs> and Ginny and Bobby was a spinoff of Married with Children. Okay. Uh, an actor you might have heard of named Matt LeBlanc. I remember the and show. So, he did uh, a little uh, show about friends or something, right? Uh, something like that. So oh. he, um, he's a man with a plan. Um, so uh, I, was I was on unemployment and I got hired on this, uh, as a regular on this series. And I was so excited. And so I was making $10,000 a week starting salary for two weeks and then I got fired because I wasn't fat enough and oh. they called and said uh the network wants to make some changes and you're one of them and I've been eating and eating trying to get my job back for <laughs> over 40 um, but uh they literally it was it's true they there was another actor named John Finette who was a big stand-up comic and by big I mean a very large man but very famous as well. And I was supposed to be his brother. Um, I think we were called the Belly Brothers, which is even stupider. But um, uh -huh. uh, so then I, I, so basically the story is I was on unemployment making 10 grand a week for two weeks and then I was back on unemployment. Oh, that's Hollywood. That's yeah. Hollywood. Wow. Let's see, I don't think there's a single woman in Hollywood that was ever told that they weren't fat enough. Mm. So I think that's an anomaly that saved uh, for the male species. Uh, lucky me <laughs> actually that's not true I do remember in conservatory that uh, they did tell a girl they said look you got to go one way or the other either you and this is this is a while ago and I'm happy that things are changing but they're like either you've got to be slim and svelte and you know petite if you want to be an actress or if you're going to be overweight you have to be really overweight so you could play the chubby best friend so you could play they said you can't be sort the of middle. in the middle and now it's like thank thank god things are changing and we've got you know real women as the plus changing size models or, changing or not nobody fucking knows they don't <laughs> know they think they know and they don't you go to these auditions with these kids who just graduated from college who are network executive and don't even know who Shecky Green is, or who <laughs> Pearl was, or who Jackie Gleason was. Yeah. And, and they're auditioning you to be in some, it's like, it doesn't matter. They have no clue. They think they do. I don't either. I've been wrong about a lot of people, situations, circumstances, and nobody really knows. So it's mm -hmm. all bullshit. It is. And I think now, and I'm so happy there's more, it feels like there's more opportunity. And as people are, noticing that they want to see diversity on tv i mean you know not everybody's a supermodel and people want to see someone who looks like themselves except for mark who started his career as the model I'm, yeah, and, yeah. and david with i'm the about hair. to i'm about to start my career as a model I'm, i just learned from this episode that's the way to go uh, modeling <laughs> agencies i'm here you know we're purple Let's we can go hair. red we can go blue we can go others um i'm ready I'm still oh. waiting to cast David in my weird Al Yankovic. Like, uh, I'm down. Yeah. You're down. You're there. The young weird Al. I think that's exactly it. Um, Probably the all same right. age. <laughs> Did you have any other uh, stories about? Oh, I got a million stories. All right. If you want to pick your next best story, I know we were talking about Robert Here, Duvall. I think I told you this one too. I was. I had an audition to be a series regular on a show that starred. Um, Don Wrinkles and Richard Lewis. And they were looking for a Stephen Wright type. And so I went to the audition. I'm sitting in the green room with a bunch of other actors. Down the hall comes Don Wrinkles and Richard Lewis and they walk into the audition room. 
and they're in there for about 20 minutes and you can hear screams and laughter and just unbelievable. And it turns out that Don Rickles basically was doing his Vegas act for about 20 minutes and the door opens and literally, I'm not kidding you, people come out and tears are streaming down their face on both sides and out walks Don Rickles, out walks Richard Lewis and I kid you not, out walks Stephen Wright. And then they casting director comes out and goes, okay, Mark Beltzman, you're next. (laughs) Really? Okay. I got this. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Maybe if you had brought your tuba, maybe that could have saved the day for that. I should take my tuba everywhere I go. I agree. Now, how did you get into tuba? How old were you when you first started playing? I had an older brother, Barry Beltzman, who went through two or three instruments and uh, it came my turn and my parents said, no way, we're not going through that again. So the teacher, Mr. Bukin, at Dow Elementary in Detroit uh, said, well, there's a sousaphone in the back. And I was like, great. And so that's how I ended up. It found me. I didn't find it. And so uh, I, I, got, I started playing and I learned really fast and got so good that, that the teacher would take me out of my classes because I was you know, pretty smart kid back then and got all straight A's. So he would take me out of class to go play at the other schools he taught at because he didn't have any tuba players at the other schools. Wow. So I would get to go oh. and do kinds of stuff like that. You know what, that is such an uplifting story that uh, I think David, I think we need to like blow some of our troubles away and we need to go to a happier spot to talk because the tuba makes me happy. So David, can we blow this dark group gloomy scene and take us somewhere over the rainbow? Please. (laughs) Oh, here we are. This is better. This suits you well, Mark. I was like, what? I wonder what rainbow sound effect you've got. Are you supposed to play? Is that the deal I got to do? Not yet, because I want. I have a few more questions about your tuba. So now you you said your tuba is very old. Yeah. Uh, My tuba is a hundred and nine years old. Incredible. Uh, stored about uh, 10 years ago, and uh, I didn't have it refinished, but uh, I had all the dents taken out. And they, when they took it apart in about 100 pieces, it's made by hand, and they showed me all the hammer marks inside the tube. It literally was formed by hand. It was made by J.W. York and Sons in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1912. Um, and I've had it since high school, so I've had it about 40 years or 50 years. And, it's uh, just, you know, it's, it sounds amazing. They don't make them like they used to. It's much bigger than any other tuba that you could buy these days. And the bell is huge. And uh, it's just a, one of those magical things that, again, it found me. And uh, we're in love. Other than my wife, I think it's the most treasured possession. <laughs> and it's got such, like, this rich, juicy sound to it. Like, it sounds <laughs> like... Yeah, uh, you know, some... You know how you take a, like an album and you have to put it through um, a, a sound mixer and they mix all the sound and then it sounds even better? Well, this yes. sounds like it's already been mixed when you play it first. You've got a self-mixing tuba. Because a little bit will screw up the notes, which that happens a lot. <laughs> now, I love the show. Mark had this fabulous show in Los Angeles uh, called Tuba Czar, which yep. is a fantastic name, by yes. the way, for a uh, spell that. check. It's Tuba C-Z-A-R, right? Yes. Too bizarre, but it's also too bizarre. I'm just going to wait and see how YouTube is going to caption that. But uh, this is where Mark invited all of his extremely talented friends to uh, come and do an evening of music. But the caveat is that you had to have a tuba part somewhere. And Mark sat center stage and had his friends play around him. And you had an incredible guests on that show who are some of the people who played it too bizarre yeah i you know am impressed with who i even got to show up uh sometimes it was really great uh lawrence juber who was paul mccartney's guitarist would do my show quite regularly and uh marcy levy who wrote um lay down sally for eric clapton who was his backup singer for years did it tony bronigal who's a drummer for blues brothers and bonnie ray who Bonnie Raitt showed up to Too Bizarre? No, no, no. The drummer, oh. her drummer. Okay. Uh, Tony Bronigal, uh, who's a good friend of mine. He, he and I were on the According to Jim together. Um, 
yeah, uh, just some really amazing, and then a lot of local talent uh, in LA. Um, uh, Tracy Newman and Cynthia Carl, um, uh, Gary, uh, I can't think of everybody's name right now. Tracy Newman was one of my favorites. She oh, was she so was funny. Yeah. Yeah, she yeah, sang yeah. these comedy songs and Mark would play the tuba right along. Yeah. With all of them, with every single musician. Yeah, it's very eclectic and it's up. really fun. And, and, and people, you know, know a tuba can play oofah, but most people don't know that a tuba can actually play a melody. So, um, you know, I would always start the show playing something solo so people would understand it, it can play just about anything. Well, I think that's a good segue. I think yeah. you should have a little tuba demonstration. So we're going to uh, have Mark turn off his green screen. We give him a rainbow hat, so uh, or, or earmuffs, depending on how you look at it. And right. just because we wanted to be able to show the beauty of the tuba, which the green screen was very uh, untuba friendly. So, Mark, since you you were the one who chose our magical location of rainbows, can you play us a little something, something, please? <laughs> buy you a drink for that one so uh david can you take us to the bar as and then we'll have mark join us once he gets his green screen so we can give you a proper applause okay. sure. oh my gosh that was just so heartfelt i'm just yeah i was leaning forward just uh bravo bravo maestro Cheers. that was great that was hey. just I, I've never heard it on a tuba. I wouldn't think, hey, let's play somewhere over the rainbow, but mm. on a tuba. That's one of my favorite things to play. Well, <coughs> I actually learned it because um, the re one of the reasons I started doing tubas are was to give my um, mentor and Fred uh, and friend Fred Kaz an opportunity to play. I would I would do the whole show and he would always be the last one. And then I would just let him have the rest of the evening and he'd play for about a half an hour or so. Fred Kaz, if you don't know, was the piano player at Second City from 1963 until the 90s. So Fred Kaz played for everybody you could ever imagine who was on stage at Second City. John Belushi, John Candy, Bill Murray, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. He was uh, an amazing um, hero of mine. And he was kind of like a father figure. I called him Papa. And so I would always say, and uh, I mean, people would flock to my show at the beginning just to hear him. I mean, I, I, I was I was a total whore and just, you know, 
making people come to you know to my shows to listen to him and uh, but that's the fun of that show too bizarre is um really cool because it's a one-man operation i produce it i host it i cast it i get all the charts together and i basically showcase other artists and, uh, and you're generous that way. I, I mean, between teaching and directing and like you said, do you now I know you teach improv, which we're going to talk about in a moment, but I'm curious if you still perform improv. Are you part of any groups at the moment that work out? No, no, there's no, no, there's nothing to work out with or for. No right Zoom, now. no Zoom comedy, no virtual. No, no it's, um, it's a tough road to hoe. I mean, it's just the you know, teaching is, is very challenging to say the least, uh, mm -hmm. performing, you know, I directed this play we'll talk about, and this taken a lot of work and some amazingly talented people in front of the camera and behind the camera to make this play work. And uh, it's a real challenge. So improv is very challenging to make work on a stage in front of an audience, let alone <laughs> on Zoom where there's nobody there. So uh, <laughs> it, it's great, but no, I, I, I love performing and I'm like in talk on three movies and I'm auditioning for stuff in Oahu and always working on something and, and performing as much as I can, but there's, there's really nothing to do right now. I was actually cast as Big Daddy in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof at, on the biggest theater here on Maui. And really? We in full blown rehearsals when uh, the pandemic shut everything down. So I didn't oh. get a chance to do it. And then I was supposed to direct a play at the other uh, theater, Pro Arts Playhouse, uh, which we're supporting through my play. And uh, we'll talk about that when you buy a ticket, a portion goes to support them and keep community theater alive here on Maui. Um, and I was supposed to direct something there. And we were just about to have auditions when everything got shut down. And um, uh, I, uh, luckily, I'm, that playwright and I have become friends, and he's the one who wrote the script for the play I'm directing right now. Well, since we're talking about it, we can go ahead and hop to that Maybe for a second. Uh, please set up and tell us. Um, um, well, here's Mark's acting classes, which absolutely. Yeah, classes, uh, classes, go ahead and tell them about that, Mark. Yeah, classes are on Zoom, um, and you can contact me through my website, markbeltsman.com. Um, and uh, there's all the information on there about it. And I teach Thursday evening, 6.30 Hawaiian time, which is 9.30 in LA, so you still could do it. And Saturdays is two o'clock, which is five o'clock in, 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 uh, in LA. And of course, uh, you know, 8 p.m. In, on the East Coast, you right. could all join. Uh, but yeah, it's 40 bucks and there's just drop in on Zoom to keep people um, kind of, you know, keep their chops up and, and keep working and keep practicing and rehearsing. And I love teaching and it's just all, we call it improv and acting, but it's all just life lessons. You mm -hmm. know, make your partner look good, you look twice as good. Be in the moment, be honest, truthful, and real. Like I said before, figure out what's working and do more of it instead of trying to fake change and fix what's wrong. And so they're all really just life lessons and you don't have to want to be an actor in order to take these classes. Now, is it scene study or are you just- No, it's all improv. It's, it's all just, improv. I call it, it's a master class in acting taught through improvisation. I find that um, as a actor and uh, uh, trained in improvisation, uh, when teaching this stuff, I have a lot more experience on camera in movies and television than most of the people I know teaching improvisation. So they can teach that uh, level of improvisation to a certain point, but I get into the, real minutia of being an actor through improvisation mm. and uh, what that entails. Now you, have you improvised in a lot of movies where the director says, okay, this one's for fun, just uh, go ahead and play? Yeah, well, as a director, you, you kind of know how this works. Uh, the, the actor, the director and the writer want you to do it the way they wrote it. And then you do it the way they wrote it. And then you can either, you know, on your own kind of throw in a, a paraphrased line or an idea that you might have, but very often, like you said, Hillary, they're, okay, this one's for you. And you just, and they end up most of the time, I'd say about 80% of the time using what you either improvise or made up yourself because it sounds more natural and it's usually, you know, funnier because it comes from your heart. Don't tell me you're holding back. I mean, like, all right, we're going to make this uh, writer, they're going to, they're going to see how uh, that, you know, how I would improvise this. Yeah, I also teach uh, sketch writing on Monday nights too, if you're interested in that. So you can take lots of Mark classes with Mark. He can teach you acting, sketch writing, Private improv. Coach. He could do it all. And so 
but I, I know how proud you are of this show, um, that it's something, and it's going for a really good cause. It's supporting pro arts theater in Hawaii, uh, which as you know, all live theater is really taking a hit during the pandemic and um, struggling to stay alive. And we need live theater to be alive and well. And Mark yeah. has assembled a phenomenal cast here. So Mark, tell us a little bit about St. Mary Immaculate High School Reunion. Oh my God, I really, I'm so proud of this cast. It's so amazing. We had rehearsal last night and uh, uh, let's see, there's three or four people I know from Second City and then three or four people I met uh, doing Reanimator the musical. Um, and uh, I just kind of mashed them all up. And then my old friend, uh, Stuart Pankin, uh, is playing the priest and you'll all recognize him from a million things. He's just a just a gem of a man. And uh, I love everybody in this cast. They're such great ensemble people and supportive uh, and they're really funny. And it's, um, it's called um, St. Mary Immaculate High School Reunion. It's a virtual play all done on Zoom. And it's about, um, it takes place during the pandemic, a high school reunion that takes place 20 years after graduating at a high school reunion where there's a serial killer on the loose in the small town that they're all trapped in. And uh, the serial killer's only killing people from that high school. And then one of the, one of the people is the killer. And um, it's audience interactive. So you as the audience, uh, if you, when you buy a ticket, you give us your cell phone number and you get to participate in the show. I won't tell you of everything that you get to do, but at the end, you get to vote on who the killer is. And Ooh, we can have, I guess? That's cool. Can I guess? I'm going to say it's the boy who got bullied. We have a bunch of different endings. So it depends on the night that you come. If you come back a different night, you'll see. Because it it's always night. the boy who got bullied. Always. It could, always. It could be. <laughs> not necessarily. Not in this show. You're or the butler. The butler oh, did it. Or the butler. Or the maid. Should I run the clip? Yeah, no, so let's, no. uh, we've got a short clip showing a little bit about right, this. Oh, this is just the Mary promo for the play, yeah. Reboot reunion. Hey, so what's wrong, Lassie? At each performance of the show, the audience gets to choose who the killer is, but it never gets to be me. What do I get to do, flirt with the pizza guy? Ooh, I wonder if the pizza guy could be the killer. Yeah, you're not alone, Liesl. No one gets to vote for me either. And not so fast for our encore performances of St. Mary Immaculate Virtual High School Reunion. There are all new choices for who might be the killer. Oh, so it might be me? Ooh, or it might be me. You again? I mean, people need to vote for me. I mean, my character seems kind of shady. <laughs> uh, all right, okay, like you could be the killer. Boys, don't make me separate you. Any one of us could be the killer. That's the whole point. Join us on April 17th and 18th for all new endings of St. Mary Immaculate Virtual High School Reunion and find out who done it this time. Could be me. me. <laughs> oh my gosh how fun so it's only it's two nights correct just two performances yeah, three performances two on saturday april 17th and uh one on sunday and just go to st mary immaculate reunion.com for all the show times and buy a ticket and if you really uh i would love to have you all come to the show check it out and even if you're not going to come buy a ticket anyways because you're supporting community theater now, is directing new for you or something that you feel like you're getting into or you've always done? Well, I'm really loving it. I've always yeah. done it because, you know, when you teach at Second City, I've done that since, you know, since I started there and you get to uh, direct the uh, level five student shows. So uh, that's kind of where I sharpened my acting chops, I suppose, many decades ago. But I've always directed uh, stuff here and there and um, I just really love being busy. I don't care what it is, you know, mm -hmm. teaching, performing, directing, uh, acting, auditioning. I, I just, I love everything that I do. I'm so fortunate to be able to make a living doing what I love and uh, I get to do it every day. And this, this crazy pandemic has a lot of gifts. I have to say it's forced mm -hmm. us all to really take a look deep internally uh, into ourselves and what we're up to and reassess mm -hmm. and reevaluate and rearrange our priorities. And it's giving us all the opportunity to reinvent ourselves. And you and I, Hillary, are living examples of that. And we're doing this show right now as a product of you reinventing yourself during the pandemic. And this play is another example of how I've reinvented myself during the pandemic. And we just continue to create because we're creators. It's true. I think creative people 
create, like you just said, and that one feeds the other that I know my directing, which is my first love, you know, makes me a better writer because I, I see things as a director. I've always seen things as a director. Um, and my writing makes me a better director, you know, economy of words, getting yeah. to the point, what's, what's the action to be able to really get to the point there. And so, and, you know, I, I have a music background and it's interesting that I, I think for a while I segmented it saying, well, I used to be into music and I, I was an actor in my twenties and, you know, did that professionally. And now I'm a director, but I really, um, I feel like they do blend together where yeah. uh, the way I talk to actors, like I love, I love working with actors so much because I love getting to that moment and you know the actor wants to get to that moment too and building a safe space where you can just play. I mean, so many people loved you in the Singletons, Mark. They just were like, you just, you were so much fun and so funny. And we just played that day when we were filming and you came, and I know you do improv. So it's like to give you space because that's your jam. Mm -hmm. And that's my jam is to make you happy and to make you excited about what you're doing. And the ideas start flowing and to support that and create that space around the context of the piece we were doing. And yeah. your performance is so good in that. Yeah. I find drugs and alcohol and sexual gratification helps a lot with creativity too. I think you're the first one to say that. I don't think that's been no. done before. So no. uh, you're in some new ground and maybe that you could do a class. I would take that class. That's, yeah. I have more to learn. I have a webinar about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's an important place too. Uh, I, I have a webinar, but I'm always too wasted to teach it. <laughs> Is that the OnlyFans? I think that's what that's called. <laughs> we have to do that next, David. Yeah, that's 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 the Hanging with Hillary incarnation point two point two, two point oh. Uh, my God. Um, Wait a minute. I think I might. I'm, oh. What? Oh, oh I thought I. No, I, I didn't get it to work. Sorry. And David's creativity explode. Like he he came up with that tornado bit because uh, we were doing the. Uh, uh, Wizard of those somewhere over the rainbow, and so I love David's creativity that comes out. Even though he's like, "Oh, I'm a tech guy," it's like, but he's also a musician, and you add all the creativity as well. He came up with the flying saucer bit, which is my favorite bit that came out of like last week. Oh, there we go. What do you <laughs> play? Um, electric guitar. Oh, cool. So, so this is for our viewers if they want to get creative. Yeah. Do you can you see that, Mark? Just boom. Uh, yeah. 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 So. No! Oh, my dog no. does not like that oh, one bit. No. Yeah. I'll right, put that away. She's yeah. She's trained. She's a, she's a drug dog. Yeah, yeah but I'm I'm a, a, a self learned electric guitar. Right. I just started taking lessons after five years of self learning to try to take it to the next level and find out what I'm doing right and doing wrong. And one of the first things I learned is somewhere over the rainbow. That's how you recognize. Oh, I forgot. Is it a perfect fifth or is it an octave? Bum uh, bum. And it's the same same as Star Wars. I think an it's an octave. octave. It's an octave. Bum bum. Bum 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 bum. And also bum bum. That is true. Bum 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 bum. I did music theory for years in my early Ooh. early childhood, and oh. yeah, we had all these. It's, close to like mnemonics but to to memorize all the octave pitches like um here comes the bride it's like a perfect fourth dun 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 and then perfect fifth is one up dun 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 and then uh, like a major six is my bonnie my bonnie lives up that's a that's a like major sixth and uh uh oh my god see it stays in there major seventh i think was a uh, bon um valley high from um the uh, old, old South Rogers South and Hammerstein music, South Valley South. High, that's like <laughs> my uh, major seventh. And yeah, and a, and a perfect, or a major, oh my God, DeAndre's gonna kill me, our, our composer friend. Um, it's, yeah, it's a perfect octave. I'm just starting, I don't know any of that yet. I, I know the perfect fifth, I've heard of that. And I heard, I've heard of an octave and I know a couple scales now. You do? Charlie. 
I, I think someone's at my door. Um, ask the next question, David. I'm going to, I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll okay. take over. I got this. So right on. Oh, we can fill. We yeah, fill. yeah. So uh, you're learning too, but was it, you know, like my learning guitar where I'm like, oh my God, I got my hands on this thing. I'm going to see what sounds it could make. I'm going to make it sound like songs that I know. And then someday I'm like, um, someone help me figure out, you know, how, how much was self-taught and how much was really funny, you know, I, cause I do this show too bizarre. I play with so many different people and some people can read music. Some people can't, some people can write music. Some people can't. Um, I've had people have to hum a note in the app on my phone so we can figure out what the hell to play. Um, but I learned uh, to read music right from the beginning. Oh, wow. And, that, and it's really weird because I, I, I'm an improviser by profession. And that's all I do is in my life is improvise everything that I do. And um, I can't and don't really improvise much on the tuba. I can noodle around. I can follow people, but if you said, hey, can you play Valley High or can you play Here Comes the Bride? I, I can't do it without music. So I'm, I'm mostly a sight reader writing. as well. Um, I'm, I'm mostly, I, I call it a sight reading. I'm most, I don't use traditional sheet music. I yeah. use the tablature, but I'm mostly a sight reader and, and I'm, I'm kind of like a player piano, 30,000 songs. You could put them in front of me and, and you know, except for yeah. the really crazy stuff. Well, I, can, I, can, I, can I can get through it. I can memorize lines to a four hour play, but I, I don't memorize music. It's weird. It's, it's, it's very hard. Other people like Bill Larkin, who we had on, or uh, who was oh one of our goodness. early guests. And he plays by ear, but he works out that muscle by doing like Howl at the Moon, like taking suggestions left, right, and center. Yeah. And then he's able to improvise and riff off the songs. Yeah. And he said he doesn't actually read music that well. It's mm -hmm. all by ear, wow. which, such a gift. I'm so jealous. Everybody's because... different. Everybody does it yeah. different. You never know. We missed you, Hillary. Well, yeah, and it was there was nobody there. It was a false alarm. She um uh, Charlie's just not getting enough attention. I think there needs to be a Charlie segment. We do need to have a Charlie segment. David and I were talking about that. We're gonna have to film something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. She's she definitely needs to be featured. She made an appearance during one of the shows, but um, yeah, she's she's keeping watch now at the window. Um, all right, let's see what else we had here. So we talked about your show. Oh, I know. So if if you had to give one piece of advice to younger Mark Beltzman about your career, what would it be? Just be yourself. With trying to be somebody else or compete with other people. Did you feel like that you had that you were trying to be someone else when you were younger, when you were a kid? Yeah, I think I think the there's a cancer in Los Angeles where you compare yourself to other people, especially your friends who are very successful and working all the time and making millions, and you can't pay your bills, and uh, it's it, it's a cancer, and, and it will eat you alive unless you just stay within your lane, do your thing, be authentic, true to yourself, and don't sell out or do things that you think other people will like or do things that don't think get you hired or do things that you think. Because mm. I always say in class when I teach, if you think you're fucked and we all get in trouble when we start thinking or overthinking and we go into that suck hole and we start in the negative what if thing. Oh, this is great. I want to get this out. So this is a this is another kind of a pet peeve of mine is there's a societal epidemic of what ifing and we mm -hmm. all what up to the negative if somebody cuts you off in traffic we all go what if that guy would have hit me well he didn't right maybe he was in a hurry and late for some maybe his kids in the hospital maybe he just didn't see you so mm -hmm. what and so why don't we start what ifing to the positive since none of us can predict the future None of us, nobody knows what's going to happen in five minutes, let alone five or 50 years. So why not? What if this is the greatest thing that ever happened? What if this is the greatest moment that ever, this is the greatest lesson I'll ever have. And what if to the positive instead of what yep. if to the negative. And I think that's another societal thing that goes on in LA is we all, what if we'll never work again. I used to be in this class with Harry Master George, who's a great teacher and taught all the greats. Yeah, in, in, in LA and uh, John Wayne's kids were in that class. Uh, Ethan and Patrick would come once in a while and they would talk, talk, talk to me about, about their dad and say, 
you know, John Wayne thought he would never work again after every movie he ever did. Could you imagine John Wayne just mm -hmm. like freaking out, having high anxiety over the fact that he will never work again? It's crazy. But that's what L.A. does because it's such a user friendly environment. And, um, you know, it is what it is. I, I love living there. It was very good to me. I have such gratitude for the industry, for the business. I'm, st I'm not retired. Even though I live in Maui, I'm not. I still want to work. And I am constantly creating my own opportunities. But, uh, yeah, it's just um, it's a weird thing. And you got to be careful. Stay in your lane. Be authentic. Be yourself. And enjoy. Figure out what makes you happy. Yes. Well, it's so, I love that what that message, and I actually grabbed it because I have this note that sits at my desk to remind me that yeah, says, yeah. "Stop worrying." Oh, that's perfect. And get excited yeah. about what can go right. Absolutely. And that's from my yoga studio, which sadly had to fold during the pandemic, they oh. didn't make it, but they kept lots of little notes um, by the door, and you would reach in and you grab a little folded note, and this one. This is so true because Definitely. like our brains as human beings, we go, 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 go. And that's what meditation is, is just to learn to separate and watch the thoughts go by, but right. notice exactly right. So it's just a waste of imagination. So I, I, it's a sentiment I try to practice as often as possible. Not try, do. No, no try, do. Yes. There is no Thank try. You. That Yoda, uh, I think we are just about up in time. That oh, <laughs> hour no. has flown. I know, I yeah. know. But we're gonna go back to our talk show set. Uh, I know it's just flown. Now let's give a round of applause for another round to Mark Beltzman for being yeah. a fabulous guest all the way from Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. <laughs> oh my gosh, and for sharing your talents and your words of wisdom. Uh, for those of you who are still stick, who have stuck around, thank you so much. And if you're watching this later, um, tune in next week. We've got Dalen Musson, who is a writer, who's uh, we're, we're going to have a Ring of Writer segment on the show with some special surprise guests and Jamie Neal on uh, 421. But until then, uh aloha mark thank you for being here hello we say mahalo here mahalo mahalo mahalo, mahalo. lots to learn and david as usual thank you so much for being my fabulous <laughs> co-host this was fun fun. thanks for having me uh i really enjoyed myself and i hope everybody enjoyed it and uh Go to markbelsman.com and buy a ticket to St. Mary Immaculate High School. Buy a ticket, support the theater, and see a very funny show. And with that, uh, we are out. So, I, David. I need an excuse to go to Maui Didi. now. I know. Yeah, yeah, Dee yeah. needs to take me to Maui. Uh, come on, Dee Dee, we're going to Maui. David. Yay. Hey.